We're just now going live on YouTube, Facebook, and on Facebook, and we are joined with author Christopher Lehman, who wrote the book, Slavery's Reach. Uh, say what's up to the audience out here, uh, Facebook, YouTube. Good evening. Thanks for tuning in. So I ran across this book, Slavery's Reach, and was shocked and was very, very, very impressed. Um, what motivated you to write Slavery's Reach? Well, I was motivated to write the book because I was shocked by my findings about slaveholders who invested in Minnesota's real estate and businesses and other enterprises. And I felt that the best way to get the word out about my findings was by writing and publishing a book. And Slavery's Reach is the result of about five years worth of research on the investments by Southern slaveholders in a very Northern and otherwise free state. Absolutely, so-called um, free state. Yes. With who were some of those slave owners that you stumbled upon through this research? Well, the very first ones that I found were people who had come even before Minnesota was organized as a territory. Mm. And actually they didn't come to Minnesota at all. There are people who were in Minnesota who had come from Northern states and they were the people who dealt in the fur trade, but the company that they worked for was actually a company based in St. Louis, Missouri. And the people who operated that company were slaveholders. So the people in Minnesota who were trading in fur, people who would be considered Minnesota's founding fathers, like Henry Sibley and Henry Rice, mm. John Prince, all those Minnesotans were paid by slaveholders in St. Louis for trading in fur. And so that started in the 1830s and 40s. And by the time you get to the 1850s, the American Fur Company that was operating in St. Louis is no longer operating in fur, but operating in real estate instead. And some of those same Minnesotans who were trading in fur started selling off some of the land that the St. Louis Company owned in Minnesota. So those were the first people that I found. Wow. So yeah, this is very interesting to under to know that even though so-called slavery wasn't happening here in Minnesota, that there were actual businesses here in Minnesota uh, as early as the 1830s who were using money that they earned from slavery to buy real estate right here in Minnesota. That's right. And after the Minnesotans received the money from the slaveholders, they used that money to develop communities such as Henry Sibley developing the city of Mendota mm. and Henry Rice developing quite a bit of the Twin Cities. And a lot of these people who were involved in the fur trade, that's how they became powerful in Minnesota. And so they used that power to become politically active. So Henry Rice was one of our first Congress people. Uh, Henry Sibley was actually the first governor of Minnesota when it became a free state, but he was actually still working for the slaveholders in St. Louis, selling off their land. So it, we have this weird um, conflict of interest where you have the governor of a free state working for slaveholders and still getting paid by slaveholders in, I think, between 1858 and 1860. So in about about 1830, when Dred Scott was in bondage, and um, what was the military's role, kind of, and what companies, do are we aware of any companies that were involved with, with his situation? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not sure about, well, actually, the American Fur Company, one of the partners of that company was John Sanford, who's the Sanford of Dred Scott versus Sanford. Mm but he didn't own Dred Scott the whole time. It's not until about, I think the 1850s when John Sanford becomes Dred Scott's slaveholder. 
But as far as the the slaves at Fort Stelly are concerned, they actually weren't supposed to be there legally speaking because there were two federal laws, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 and the Missouri Compromise of 1820 that said that all land that's in the area where the state of Minnesota is today is supposed to be for free states. It's free territory, and then later on it's supposed to be for free states. But in order for the U.S. Army to entice soldiers, and military officers especially, who were stationed in the South to come to Minnesota and be stationed at Fort Snelling, the U.S. Army said, even though slavery is illegal in this part of the country, if you want to bring a slave, you may, and we will even give you a stipend to care for that slave. And so that's what happened. There were quite a few military officers from Missouri who were stationed or who were reassigned to Fort Snelling. I think they had come from Jefferson Barracks in Missouri, and then they went to Fort Snelling, and they were able to bring enslaved people with them. And Dred Scott was one of those people who went from Missouri to Minnesota and eventually back to Missouri, which is where he first sued for his freedom. Right. So, wow. And so, and then people don't know at Fort Snelling, there were 20 to 30 slaves there at any given time. That's right. Besides, besides Dred, Dred and um, Perry and Scott. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um. What other businesses were here uh, in Minnesota that that uh, come to mind? Mm -hmm. Well, the insurance company that we know as Travelers Insurance today was another company before. I think it was called the St. Paul Marine and Fire Insurance Company or something like that. But a man by the name of Thomas Winston, who was a slaveholder from New Orleans, was one of the first investors of that company. Another business that's also an academic institution is the University of Minnesota. Right. And there was an enslaver from South Carolina who held somewhere between 700 and 800 people. His name was William Aiken. And it was actually at the request of Henry Rice, who was serving with Aiken in Congress, that Aiken come to Minnesota and see what he wanted to invest in. And when Aiken came to Minnesota, the U of M was actually, actually shut down. It had been closed for two years after being open for three. Mm. But in 1856, Aiken decided that he would loan $15,000 to the university. And that amounts to about a quarter of a million dollars in today's money. Wow. But when you enslave 700 people and put them to work on your plantation, then you have that kind of money. Mm. And the following summer, Aiken cashed out or took out half his loan back. So that still left $8,000 that the university owed. And then the Civil War happened and Aiken lived in a Confederate state and Minnesota didn't want to owe money to a Confederate because he would be considered the enemy or living in enemy land. So Minnesota passed a law called the Rebellion Act in 1862 that said that no resident of a Confederate state can come to Minnesota and sue in its courts. So if Aiken wanted to get his money back, now he can't. So well, so the University of Minnesota never had to pay the money back to the slave holder that they got the money from. That's correct. And they never did. Um, was Aiken also a governor in his yes. state? Or? Okay. Yes, he was a governor of South Carolina as well as a congressman out of South Carolina. Wow. What about John C. Calhoun? Hmm. I have not found any direct connection of John C. Calhoun to Minnesota, but there are certainly other people in the government, the federal government, who were involved. Uh, for example, when Aiken came to Minnesota, he actually came with another congressman from South Carolina by the name of James Orr. And Orr invested 
in real estate in Minnesota, including where I'm sitting in St. Cloud. Mm. And you may recall not that long ago, sometime within, I guess, the past year, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, decided to remove portraits of former speakers who had been involved in the slave trade. And Speaker Orr was one of those people. And so that's the connection that Minnesota has to James Orr, the speaker, the, um, the, the land that he invested in with money from his role as a slaveholder. Wow. And a little bit, and see, people don't understand that that money still, so the, the money that they use from free labor, then they came up here, invested in real estate and still were creating generational wealth off That's of right. uh, free labor. Yes. Alexander Ramsey. Alexander Ramsey is one of the people who was involved in land deals with indigenous people and getting that land ultimately allowed for land to be sold to people like the slaveholders. Mm. So he, he has a role with the uh, American Fur Company too. But I haven't found that much evidence of him being as involved in American Fur over the years as Henry Sibley and Henry Rice. Can you speak a little more about Henry Rice? I don't think a lot of people really know about him. Well, Henry Rice is an interesting figure. He was an employee of American Fur, but he also married the daughter of a Virginia slaveholder. And so mm -hmm. he has those two connections to slavery. I haven't found any evidence that he himself was a slaveholder, but he certainly had ties to that wealth, especially because he married into it. And he parlayed that wealth into real estate. He not only owned land in Minnesota, but he also was a co-investor of land in Washington, D.C. Mm. while he was serving in Congress. So he would invite people that he served, in, served with in Congress to come to Minnesota and invest in real estate. William Aiken was one of those people. I believe John, Re John Breckinridge, who was in Congress and later became vice president, was another person who bought land in Minnesota. Wow. That, see, this is a history that people need to understand and make the connections, make these connections. Um, Joseph Lowry, where you're at right now in St. Cloud, can you uh, speak about him and his connections to slavery? Oh, you're talking about Sam Lowry or Sylvanus Lowry. So Sylvanus Lowry. Sure. Mm -hmm. So Sylvanus Lowry was originally from Kentucky. Mm. He and his family went from Kentucky to Wisconsin in the 1830s because President Andrew Jackson had appointed Sylvanus's father to be the missionary for the Ho-Chunk Nation. And as the federal government kept pushing the Ho-Chunk further west, the Lowry family went with them until Lowry's father retired and went back to the south, but went to Tennessee to live. But by the time the father retired, Sylvanus was an adult and he had started working for American Fur. In fact, he reported directly to Henry Rice. And when Rice quit in 1849, Lowry quit with him. But he earned enough money from the fur trade to invest in real estate of his own. And in 1855, he bought the northern third of St. Cloud, which is around where the St. Cloud Hospital is. And the following year, St. Cloud, the city, was incorporated. And Sylvanus Lowry was the first mayor. And while he was mayor, he invited his father's colleagues in the ministry from Tennessee to come to St. Cloud and buy some land from him. And mm. there were about a half dozen slaveholders who came to do that. And those six slaveholders paid, I think about $12,000 in one summer to Lowry for land. 
And again, that's a quarter of a million dollars. So Larry was able to use that money from slaveholders to start St. Cloud's business community. He was able to get warehouses built for local business people to rent for their enterprises. And a few years later, in I think 1861, he started a newspaper that is still being published today. That's the St. Cloud Times. Correct. Wow. So and that paper was uh, called the Union, but it was pro-slavery. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And yep. So and uh, that's still that's still around today, and that's called um, the the, the St. Cloud the St. Cloud Times. That's right. When you talk about uh, the book that slavery was part of some of the financial foundation here in Minnesota. And we're talking about some of these these people. Uh, can you expand a little bit on that? Yes. Um, there were three ways in which people who lived in the South and who held slaves could come to Minnesota when slavery was illegal here. The first way was to either free all their enslaved people in the South or free them in Minnesota. And I have not found evidence of anyone who did that. The second way was for enslavers to find someone in the South to hold their slaves for them while they were living in Minnesota. And I found evidence of people who did that. And then the third way was for enslavers to sell all the enslaved people in the South and then come to Minnesota without them. And I found instances of that happening. In fact, in chapter three of Slavery's Reach, I quote from a couple of advertisements in newspapers where people who ended up moving to Minnesota announced in their hometown newspapers in the South that they're gonna hold auctions to sell all these people before they go. Wow. So basically they would sell, if you did sell all your slaves, then you're still taking money from slavery, from people who are in bondage, and then you're coming to Minnesota, and then you're buying land and you're buying businesses and creating generational wealth for uh, their children. That's right. And the Pace and the Spain families of Virginia were able to build up the town of Belle Plaine after having auctioned off their slaves. And the Garrick family of East Baton Rouge, Louisiana, was able to build up the city of Shakopee after mm. having auctioned their slaves. And there are other examples. Um, I believe there's George Clitheroe of Alabama who bought quite a bit of land in Scott County as well. But what happens when you have Minnesotans who come with all this money from auctions is that they're using money from activity that split families from each other and split mothers from babies, split husbands from wives and so on. And you no, know, it is essentially blood money that's yes. been used to build up those particular communities in Minnesota. So I didn't know that. So Shakopee yes. was built off money from slavery. Yes, in large part. Mm -hmm. Wow. See, I didn't know that. And then what's another county or another city that, that you would say that is similar to that? Well, you just said with a little bit about um, St. Cloud, but right. Well, certainly St. Cloud, at least the, the northern third of St. Cloud. There's a neighborhood in St. Paul, the Payne Phelan neighborhood, right by Lake Phelan. And there were three people from Maryland. Two of them were slaveholders, Harwood Eigelhart and William Sprig Hall. And they co-invested in the Payne Phelan neighborhood. And if you've ever noticed that neighborhood having streets that have names of Southern flowers, it's because they're from the South and that's the name. Those are the names that they wanted to give to those streets like Ivy, Magnolia, Hyacinth, Jessamine, 
And of course, there's a Maryland Avenue and there's an Eichelhart Avenue. So that's why it, it came from these slaveholders from Maryland who decided that they would come to Minnesota and invest in real estate. And Williamsburg Hall eventually became a judge and Harwood Eichelhart, he's one of the people who arranged for someone to hold his enslaved person for him in Maryland while he was living in Minnesota. His, he, he held a woman and the woman is held in his name in the 1860 census, right by the names of, I'm sorry, right by the enslaved people under the name of Harwood's father. So I think that Harwood's father kept Harwood's slave, but still in Harwood's name. Meanwhile, Harwood Iglehart is living in St. Paul while he's officially actively a slaveholder in Maryland. Wow. So I so if you live on so Iglehart is a street here in St. Paul, and that is named after a slave owner. That's right. Maryland Avenue. So when you're riding on Maryland, you might live on Maryland. Um I've had I, I stayed right off of Maryland before. If you live um off of Maryland. That's talking about the state of Maryland, I believe, was Harriet Tubman, or there was slaves from Maryland. I won't say, she, but slavery was in Maryland, and there were slave owners from Maryland who invested heavily in the Payne Phelan area, and that's why Maryland Avenue is called Maryland today. That's right. And also, I'm just uh, going back over what you said, because it's kind of uh, Ivy Avenue, Magnolia. That's Magnolia is are named after flowers from the south, and because of the, and they're named that because this is what these slave owners were named were naming. That's correct. Wow. Yep. That um, the one on Iglehart, that uh, that hit hard. Hmm. Uh, finding out, I I you know had aunts and uncles and people who's who live on Iglehart or who have lived on Iglehart. So to know that that's actually named after a slave owner um, is interesting. And that's why when we're doing this reparations work, some of the reparations work is about changing some of the names of these streets and uh, some of these schools who were um, who's named after slave owners, like or people who were involved in white supremacist activity like Henry Sibley. I think they just changed the name of that school, too. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah, I, th I think it's important to, to do that work because it's very traceable. I mean, the work that I did involved looking at real estate deeds. My method was for any county that existed before 1865, when slavery was made illegal nationwide, I would go to see if there were any people from the South who came to Minnesota before 1865 to buy land. And if anyone was listed in a deed as a, as a Southerner, then I would go to the census records and see if that Southerner was a slaveholder. And if that Southerner was, then I knew that that real estate deed was this paper trail that documented money changing hands from a slaveholder to a Minnesotan or vice versa sometimes. So for anyone who's doing the work of reparations, you have the paper trail, you have the evidence of the money changing hands, money coming from a plantation to a Minnesotan. So, right. the, so, the, so all you would have to do is use that as your your foundation of proof, your foundation of fact and evidence to say that this is how we know that Minnesota has these um, this history of these purchases that come from the labor of the enslaved. I mean, Minnesota, even though it's as far to the north as it is, 
it's still part of the United States. Yes. And slavery was such a powerful institution in this country that you couldn't live in the country and not be affected by it, no matter how far to the north you are. So what I tried to do in my book was to show exactly how, at least through looking at real estate deeds. Wow. Um want to thank you for coming on the show tonight. If there's any, if um anybody wants to get in touch with you or wants to reach out to you for a lecture or buy the book, uh, how could they do that? Well, the book is available at Red Balloon. It's also available at a lot of Barnes and Noble um, franchises in Minnesota. Um, certainly available online through any online bookstore. Um, if people want to contact me directly, I am a public employee working at St. Cloud State, and my email here at work is cplayman at stcloudstate.edu, st being st, uh, stcloudstate.edu, and I certainly welcome the conversation, and if slavery's reach can be useful in the struggle for reparations, then that would be great. We're definitely using the book. Um going to continue to use the book and continue to uh, invite you out to speak at some of these events. Uh, we definitely need your expertise on this subject. Um, are there any last words or anything that you would like to add about just how wealth was built off of free labor, even, even in places like Minnesota. And I know, you know, I'm, I'm a, I want, I know you got to go, but I just wanted to um, kind of reiterate on just what you were saying, how slavery, even though slavery was considered illegal in Minnesota, Dred Scott was here and people who were enriched off slavery were here, were here also. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess the last thing I'll say is that we should always be conscious of a timeline of when things happen. So if we look at the starting point being 1619, at least for the British part of American colonization, you can even go back to 1565 with Spain being in Florida. But start at 1619 or 1565, and then the end point being 1865, that means that any time in between those two years was when slavery was existing. So in between those two years, you have Minnesota becoming a territory in 1849, Minnesota becoming a state in 1858. So when that happens at statehood, the end of slavery is still seven years away. And then in between the territory years and the statehood period, um, there's the Dred Scott decision. <clears throat> See, in 1857, the Supreme Court said that any territory that somebody wanted to take a slave to, he could or she could. And it didn't matter if it was in the North or the South. So that made every single territory a slave territory. There were no free territories anymore. And Minnesota was still a territory. It would be another 14 months, another year before statehood. So from March of 1857 to May of 1858, slavery actually was legal in Minnesota. and Chattel book, slavery. Yes. And my book talks about quite a few people who took advantage of that 14-month window. Can and, we go into that for a couple of minutes? I know sure. you got to go, but who, sure. are, who are some of the slate and how did they take advantage of that? Well, Sylvanus Solari's brother, uh, Tom Cal brother-in-law, Tom Calhoun, was one of those people because... Tom Calhoun, okay. Yeah, Lowry had asked Calhoun to watch his house while Lowry went overseas to Europe. So Calhoun came to St. Cloud with his family, but also with a pregnant enslaved woman named Mary Butler in the summer of 1857. So by then, Dred Scott is the law and Minnesota is still a territory. Mary gives birth in August of 1857 to a baby boy named John. And, <clears throat> but since the law nationwide says that if a mother is a slave, the baby is a slave, that means John was born a slave in Minnesota. 
Now, when Minnesota becomes a free state, all of a sudden it becomes illegal to have slaves in Minnesota. So Calhoun has a choice. He can either free Mary and John in Minnesota, he can free Mary and John somewhere else, or he can take them back to the South in slavery. And Calhoun decides to take Mary and John back to the South, mm. and he took them back to Tennessee, which did not allow emancipation. So he probably sold Mary and John, but regardless of how he took them out, he came back to St. Cloud without them. So he probably sold them. Most likely, right. And then came back to St. Cloud with that money. Yes, with the money, right. Right. Um, thank you for coming on and, and discussing these uh, this important issue. Looking forward to having you back on and keeping you involved in this conversation about reparations that we're having in the city of St. Paul, throughout the state of Minnesota, and across the country. Thank you. Invite me anytime. Uh, we'll be next month. We'll definitely have you back. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. And that was author Christopher Lehman of Slavery's Reach, a five-star book. Um, it should be on your shelf. You should be reading that. Uh, definitely go. I think it's available on Amazon. I think it's also on Kindle, but that's a key book. Any reparationist should definitely have that book. So all my uh, reparations people for, from across the country, make sure that you go out and buy Slavery's Reach. Uh, again, I wanna remind my um, audience on Facebook and on YouTube, this week we got the uh, Bears debate and the free uh, winter coat giveaway at Dayton's Bluff Community Rec Center starting at 5 p.m. That's uh, 800 Conway here in St. Paul. Uh, then. On the 20th, there's a reparations panel with Katie Medford, um, Toya Woodland, Jeremy English, and myself. And that's on uh, Facebook. You can RSVP for that. Then Monday is what America owes Black businesses at Billy's on Grand, which is currently now Black owned. So uh, to my YouTube audience, thank you for tuning in to another edition of the Traron Cruz Show. Uh, and to my uh, audience on 94.1 FM, Frogtown, Tuned In Radio, we're going to jump back into some more music. All right? Peace.